Greetings. What a blessing it is to be with you as we commemorate and celebrate the legacy of blessed Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Bishop Dietschy, thank you for the honor of preaching in your diocese, though virtually. I am grateful for the planning committee for inviting me to be the preacher this year. New York City played an important role in Dr. King's life and ministry, even though he was a son of the South with deep roots in Georgia. Dr. King requested field education placement at the First Baptist Church of East Elmhurst in Queens, New York, while he was a student at Crozier Theological Seminary near Chester, Pennsylvania. That's a six hour round trip. I remember being a student at the General Theological Seminary when I told my classmates that I felt called to fill education at Grace La Gracia in White Plains. They looked at me sideways and said, that's so far. One would have thought from their reactions that going from Chelsea to White Plains was like taking the Acela train from Manhattan to Boston every Sunday. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave a sermon on May 17, 1956 at the age of 27 at the, at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City in front of a congregation of 12,000 people. The cathedral was brimming that day. The Reverend King entitled his sermon, The Death of Evil Upon the Seashore, based on Exodus 14:30 and a work by the Episcopal priest, the Reverend Phillips Brooks, who was famed because he wrote O Little Town of Bethlehem. The very Reverend James Pike, Dean of the Cathedral, called King's presentation the greatest sermon he had ever heard. The epistle for this celebration of blessed Martin Luther King Jr. is from Ephesians 6. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The Ephesians author then describes the clothing of someone properly vested. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, shoes, shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. The clothing from Ephesians is more appropriate for the stairway to heaven than it is for the New York Fashion District or Fifth Avenue. The Ephesians are vested and attired to fight against principalities, powers, and against spiritual wickedness in high places, as the King James Version renders the text. The Reverend King made connections to vesting and attire in his sermon at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. The Bible spoke about the belt of truth. This is what Dr. King preached. We have seen evil in high places where men are willing to sacrifice truth on the altars of their self-interest. The belt of truth taken off and girded with the cincture of deception. The Bible spoke about shoes, of peace on our feet. Dr. King continued in, in his sermon. We have seen evil in imperialistic nations trampling over other nations with the iron feet of oppression. Peaceful shoes taken off for the iron feet of oppression. And Dr. King continued, we have seen evil clothed in the garments of calamitous wars. The love of power overpowers principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness that we heard in Ephesians 6. Blessed Martin Luther King Jr. believed in the power of love. He described love in this way. Love is the greatest force in the universe. It is the heartbeat of the moral cosmos. The one who loves is a participant in the being of God. King made this clear in his 1967 speech.
And one of the great problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites, polar opposites. So that love is identified with a resignation of power and power with a denial of love. It now we got to get this thing right. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best. Power at its best is love, implementing the demands of justice and justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. Power at its best is love. Jesus said it this way in our gospel reading this morning from Luke 6, 27. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Some of the craziest looks and side eyes I've gotten from members of St. Ambrose in Raleigh, North Carolina came when I asked this question. Have you ever prayed to God for power? At the time, our congregation was studying the book uh, by Dr. Robert Lithicum, Building a People of Power, Equipping Churches to Transform Their Communities. When I asked that question, no one said, yes, I prayed for power. When I asked why, some said, it just seems wrong or egotistical. I then asked, who was the source of power? God. When do Christians get their power? At their baptism. Who is it who gives you power? The Holy Spirit. Since the Holy Spirit gives you power, then why wouldn't you pray for power? Some people have a visceral response to power and authority. One reason is that our experience of power tends to be negative. We are used to experiencing unilateral or oppressive power. That is power over people. We saw this in chattel slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, and, continued, and the continued effects of white supremacy in America. Unilateral power is bad and leads to oppression. Positive power among people to build relationships is good. The African-American Roman Catholic womanist theologian M. Sean Copeland wrote this in her book, Wading Through Many Sorrows. The enslaved Africans sang of the cross of Jesus because they saw on the rugged wooden planks one who had endured what was their daily portion. The cross was treasured because it enthroned the one who went all the way with them and for them. The enslaved Africans sang because they saw the results of the cross, triumph over the principalities and powers of death, triumph over evil in this world. St. Martin Luther King Jr. believed in the power of the wooden plank of the cross. He saw in Jesus the one who had endured what black people in America endured daily then as now, a daily crucifixion. The black American crucifixion then as now was not on a green hill far away called Golgotha, but on the suffocating hill of white supremacy. White supremacy is one of the powers and principalities. It is the false belief that one race or group of people is inherently superior to another race or group. White supremacy has and continues to permeate our systems, government, legal, and religious. Dr. King spoke of structural racism, what we now call systemic white supremacy. King wrote and preached about the ills of structural racism in policing, education, and housing, and the economy at Stanford University in 1967 with a speech that he called the other America. 
Now the other thing that we've got to come to see now that many of us didn't see too well during the last 10 years, and that is that racism is still alive in American society and much more widespread than we realize. And we must see racism for what it is. It is a myth of the superior and the inferior race. It is the false and tragic notion that one particular group, one particular race is responsible for all of the progress, all of the insight and the total flow of history and the theory that another group or another race is totally depraved, innately impure, and innately inferior. I remember witnessing churches living out their power to transform realities while a seminary student in New York City at General. Our pastoral theology class took a field trip to St. David's Church in the South Bronx. We met with the rector and other community members in the parish hall who talked about community organizing and a power group called the Industrial Areas Foundation, IAF. I heard a long time Bronx resident describe working to change unjust systems of oppression in her neighborhood around housing, education, and public safety. She told our class that in the 1970s, landlords torched their apartment buildings they owned in order to collect insurance money. The community lost 80% of the South Bronx housing, displacing 250,000 residents. I couldn't believe what I heard. Regular people organizing to affect real change in their communities. I later learned that this diocese, the Diocese of New York and the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of New York were two primary financial supporters when IAF came to New York in the late 1970s, early 1980s. There were Episcopal congregations in the South Bronx that helped form an IAF affiliate called the South Bronx Churches. I heard the history of how this power organization formed in the South Bronx. And what I heard, I called ironing board transformation. 10 years ago, I preached at the 40th anniversary to the priesthood of my friend and general seminary professor. He told me that he used his ironing board as a practice altar as he practiced celebrating the Holy Eucharist before his ordination to the priesthood. When I asked him from the pulpit if he still had that ironing board 40 years later, he explained, of course, ironing board transformation happened in this way. The South Bronx community members wanted to get 100,000 petition signatures in 100 days in order to take two elected officials. This was in the mid to late 1980s. Leaders took ironing board outside of subway entrances. Why? You can sign up to five to six people at one time and not require using any clipboards to get those signatures. They took the ironing board and improved patent by an enslaved African named Sarah Boone and used that as a tool for forming power. An apparatus used to make vestments and clothes crisp and sharp was the instrument to iron out injustices in the community. The leaders collected 100,000 signatures in 100 days and they placed them in a box that some clergy called the Ark of the Covenant. And when they went into meetings with elected officials holding their Ark, they would place it on the table and the official will ask, what's in that box? 100,000 signatures, our leaders exclaim. Elected officials paid attention and listened to those community members. That's one story of forming a power organization, the South Bronx churches. The Bronx Inner Parish Councils formed this annual worship service in the early 1990s to honor the Reverend 
Dr. King not long after IAF formed in the Bronx. Uh, the Bronx and the Paris Councils thought that investing in graduating high school students was the way to honor the legacy of Dr. King. A scholarship fund would be something positive for the youth while encouraging education. Graduating seniors, seniors who were active in Bronx Episcopal churches received anywhere from around $500 to $1,000 in scholarship money. This fund has benefited hundreds of children and students. Christians are people of the resurrection. And yet it is my experience that Christians do not discuss resurrection as something that is happening in the present. Instead, the resurrection is often understood as a past event or something that a select group of people can look forward to in the future. Few Christians see resurrection as something that should impinge upon the present moment. The writer of Mark's gospel records the compelling story of Christ's resurrection and his imperative to his disciples. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The Greek word for creation is the English word cosmos, which encompasses the entire universe. Through Christ's resurrection, the good news of restoration is not only something meant for all nations, but the entire cosmos. The resurrection of Christ permeates every aspect of our personal, public, and cosmic reality. The Eastern Orthodox theologian Vladimir Lowski wrote, it is the power of the resurrection, the reality of eternal life. These are the divine energies, the ray of divinity the creative powers which penetrate throughout the universe. The resurrection of Jesus Christ transforms our entire universe. Lowski continued, the power of the resurrection penetrates throughout the universe. The resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't about bringing life to dead people only. No, the resurrection of Jesus Christ brings new life to everything in the universe, including systems. Imagine a resurrected economic system a resurrected education and school system, a resurrected judicial system, a resurrected healthcare system. I touched resurrection as a seminary student when I listened to the stories of people's lives being changed in the Bronx. Their work helped bring about a resurrected school system in the Bronx. A resurrected education system looks like the Mott Haven campus. $240 million public school campus for 2,200 students. A resurrected education system looks like the community members pressing the New York City Department of Education and elected officials to allow $22 million to hire more staff to work with students in special education. And just last month, a resurrected education system looked like free Wi-Fi and $11 laptops to Bronx residents. This COVID pandemic turned endemic, unmasked multiple disparities that broke along racial and economic lines. Primary and secondary school classes moving to online learning unveiled the reality that not each home had neither the internet access nor bandwidth nor community computer equipment adequate to deal with remote learning. Macklin, along with over 1,200 families, will be getting free web access and $11 laptops, thanks to a program through the Emergency Broadband Benefit. Over 1,200 families here can get access to the internet you know, for, for free at first and then at affordable price after that. Helping make it happen here at the Melrose Houses Metro IAF, People's Choice Communications Block Power and Congressman Richie Torres. It's an expense that that doesn't have to be there and luckily with partnering with PCC and Block Power we've been able to help to begin to create an alternative. Womanist theologian Sean Copeland would say that the cross symbolizes what black people endure as their daily portion. Crucified on the cross of white supremacy, 
crucified on the cross of miseducation. Diocese of New York, it's time to be vested in resurrection. What better way to live out the legacy of blessed Martin Luther King Jr. than organizing together in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring down the oppressive structures that suffocate life from people. Dr. King preached at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine 66 years ago using imagery of vesting and clothing appropriate for Ephesians 6. His sermon gave post-resurrected visions of pre-resurrected reality. The belt of truth replaced waist girded with the cincture of depression. Shoes of peace on our feet replaced the iron feet of oppression. The baptismal garment replaced the evil clothes of the garments of calamitous wars. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. It's how Ephesians 6.12 described the struggle to birth a resurrected reality. Christians have the power to change the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. That same spirit that gave new life to Jesus Christ, raising him from the grave, is the same power that moves through us and the world God created. Jesus gathered his disciples right before his ascension in Luke 24. Jesus told his disciples this in the 49th verse. Stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. We are clothed with power through our baptism and anointed by the Holy Spirit. To be clothed or vested with power means divesting from white supremacy to curtail the travesty of past history and our current reality in order to reinvest in breaking down systems of oppression to make people free at last. Sounds impossible? Ephesians 3 gives the hope. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.